Hey, happy Independence Day! It's Corey with the Mentor and Engineer here, and I want to give a Fury 325 update. Yes, some things have happened in the last few days. This morning, I got some pictures from Brandon from Theme Park Predictions. Let's go. And uh, I thought it was interesting, and I asked if we could do a live event. So we're going to be doing a live event together, Theme Park Predictions, Mentor and Engineer. July 5th, 9 p.m. Eastern. Please be there. Click the link in the description below to find out where that is, and we hope to see you there. So these pictures that he sent me are really telling of Carowind's plan going forward and how they're gonna get this thing up and running much quicker than I thought. So before we get to the pictures, I want to clarify some stuff in the last video that I made, you can watch it right up here, where there was some confusion and a lot of people had some great insight that I had not thought of. The first thing is that a lot of people commented on how that support, the diagonal support, should really be on the other side and be, instead of tension like it is, be in compression so that when the coaster goes around it will push into that pole rather than pulling away from it, and I would agree. Uh, the problem with that is where it's physically located is on the parking lot so they would literally have that support be in the parking lot or the sidewalk right there and it would be uh, just an inconvenience for everybody walking around it. The second thing is I found out that these joints most likely are beveled and I was hoping that in my heart of hearts that they would be beveled beforehand uh, and that would provide a much larger weld area and a much smaller stress concentration. So good job. I mean anybody really have a doubt? This is the first major failure on a B&M coaster and they've been making great stuff for 30 years now. I know they know what they're doing and let's rest assured in that. Another possibility that was brought to my attention was that the diagonal support actually sunk. Apparently people had said it had been sinking into the ground for some time. So that in and of itself would be adding more load to the structure to that weld and that is not a good thing. So that is probably the most likely cause of the crack starting. So another thing I want to clarify is cracks when they're in fatigue grow very, very slowly at first, but then all of a sudden they gain a lot of speed and they'll essentially pry themselves apart at the end. So we don't ever want to get to that prying part because it means that most of the structural load bearing components of it are missing. So I found this great image online from G2 Material Labs. The image shows a bolt that was under tensile load and it was bending back and forth with some, some magnitude load and eventually fatigue. Looking at this cross section, it tells us a lot. It doesn't tell us everything because it's only a, a 2D representation. It tells us a lot. So the first thing it tells us is which way was the bending. And we can see that that bolt was bending uh, up and down as indicated by the horizontal line across the section. We can also definitively say that this bolt was still under some sort of constant tension load at the time of breaking because the section in the middle, the horizontal section, is not directly in the center. It's actually above that so we know there's more tensile load than compressive load when the bending stress occurs. Looking a little deeper, we can tell that the bottom and top sections are a velvety smooth texture. It's actually so you uncanny how smooth they are when you rub your finger on them. Hard to tell in a picture, I understand that. Uh, but if you have it, you run your finger across it, you can still like So once the crack starts, the oscillating load on it will create small, tiny little cracks here and there. And they'll be very, very small cracks and it'll feel like the velvet. They're really, you know, small ridges all over that thing. And eventually it'll get to a point where it just can't take the load and finally it snaps and that's where you see that horizontal line. So as you can imagine, by the time it gets to that horizontal line, that's the only thing holding it. It's not being held by that velvety part anymore. So we can see that up until the velvety part, it's holding the load still and then all of a sudden it's tearing it across. All right, that is not a good thing. So let's apply this to Fury and its support. Now, in the top left view, you have a notch in there, but it doesn't even go half the material thickness in. All right, it still looks like it's gonna hold the load. But if we keep cycling that, it is gonna get worse and worse. As we go forward, you can now see there's a bit of red in the top right 
And if it continues to go without being noticed, and we still have more than half that tube intact, but look how much of a red spot that is. So that's why I say when a crack starts, it starts small, but it advances fairly rapidly. So let's take a look at those pictures that Brandon sent over. So you can see here that they have reattached the two pieces by adding some um, plates on the end. I wish I would have thought of this, but that's a truly remarkable thing that they're doing. So my guess is that they wanted the two sections to be relieved. There's no external stresses from the, the foundation settling or the wind blowing or the coaster itself going over the track. This is its natural resting state. There's no residual stresses in those members. So they went and tied them back together. So if it were me, I would then remove this section. We're going to take it down, document it, take a billion photos of this, analyze it, write up a report, do everything we possibly need. Then I would stick it on something called a coordinate measuring machine. Now, a coordinate measuring machine is a very uh, detailed uh, measuring system that can measure in 3D space to extremely high accuracy. As we're talking uh, the fourth place of an inch, so 0 0.0001. Uh, some of them can even read further down than that. So these are incredible machines. They allow us to measure very, very small changes. Once it's on the CMM, we can measure exactly where the two supports measure the face and where the holes are, see how well they align. And we can also measure the angle between those two and the face where it mounts the track and find out how much this has shifted uh, between when it was installed and what it is now. You know, so current state versus what it should have been. Uh, so they're going to compare it to the engineering drawings from B&M and see how much it's moved. And that's going to tell us, did the foundation sink? Did something else move? Did the track stretch a little bit? Who knows? It could be a lot of things. Uh, that'll tell us so much, and that, that's the part I'm really excited for. So the next step after the CMM inspection is to go ahead, bevel that tube, weld it up. I'm probably going to add a whole bunch of gussets on it. It's going to look ugly, uh, but they're going to make it so that it is strong enough to get it back up and running. I would not be surprised if it's up and running in two to three weeks, uh, depending on how fast they're able to document and analyze and get this thing uh, approved. Now, the approval part is uh, a little bit trickier. So you need three parties at least involved. A lot of times uh, they'll hire a third party investigator, which will make it four parties. And we may have five parties in on this one. So we've got Carowinds, we've got B&M, we have at least one state board of amusement parks, uh, North Carolina. Uh, we may also have South Carolina that wants to weigh in because it does technically cross into South Carolina. Uh, and I believe this is actually in the South Carolina half where it, where, where it occurred. And then you're going to have uh, the independent uh, investigators as well. So, so all four or five of them have to agree on what happened, why it happened, how we are correcting it, and then move forward with the plan. Then it's got to go to testing. So depending on how fast all those things happen, it could be as fast as two to three weeks, uh, as long as people still keep pressing on it. And why wouldn't you, man? Fury is the main attraction there. I hope it gets up. I know it will be safe when they do it. So let's keep hope that it will open soon. I know there's a lot of people who are disappointed that had you know, family vacations uh, centered around going to Carowinds, riding Fury. So I hope they can get it back up and you can make it happen. Okay, well, that's it for this video. Uh, please take a second to like, share, and subscribe. So if you have enjoyed looking at my shirt during this video, uh, please take a second to scroll down, look at my merch. I love this shirt. You know, if it ain't broke, it doesn't have enough features. If you're an engineer, that, that is your motto, uh, whether you know it or not. Uh, so, features today. Also, I'm going to be building the world's first backyard free inversion launch coaster. It's going to be glorious. And I need your help. Uh, this is going to be a costly project. So please click that join button below. Uh, and find out how you could be a supporter. You'll get an invitation to come ride this thing when it's done. And we're going to be showing you the ins and outs of all aspects of the coaster design and showing you step by step how we're doing it. Please support us. And if you go with the Elite membership, you'll get your name engraved on a plaque. That's cool, man. 
So thank you for watching all the way to the end. Have a happy Independence Day, and we'll see you tomorrow at Theme Park Predictions, 9 p.m. Eastern.